Greetings, Electrophobia here. A lot of people have asked me questions about electronics, and I sometimes find it difficult to answer them. And after a while, I finally figured out why that is. The reason it's difficult to explain about advanced electronic concepts is because the way you are taught basic electricity back in elementary school, they teach the wrong things the wrong way. I'm not the only thing, person that thinks this. There are a lot of uh, physics and engineering teachers that feel the same way. And in fact, there was a fellow named Professor Bill Beatty that put together a lesson plan that teaches electricity the right way to elementary school students. And this was several years ago, and I don't really think it got anywhere. And it's a real shame, because it makes talking about advanced electronic concepts much more difficult if you don't know how basic electricity works. And I know how hard it's going to be to change all the textbooks and the lesson plans and the homework and all this other stuff so that it basic, uh, basic learning mirrors advanced physics learning. But it's going to have to be done if we want people to understand electronics better. So somebody's got to put together a better way to teach. Somebody is going to have to step up to the plate, put their nose to the grindstone, burn the midnight oil, and get it done. So let's do this! All right, class, settle down. That's right, settle down. Class is in session. Welcome to science class. I'll be your instructor. My name is Mr. Electricidad. And today in science class, we're going to talk about electricity. Now, I know you use electricity all the time to light up your room, to heat your breakfast, to charge up your iPod or your iPad or whatever it is you have. But what is it? What is electricity? Well, electricity is the study of charges and fields. Now, what are charges? Well, charges are all around us. Everything around is full of charges. Your textbook, your desk, your chair, even you are full of charges. Now, early scientists like Benjamin Franklin experimented with electricity and found there are two kinds of electricity. We call them two kinds of poles. They are positive and negative. And we can tell which kind of charge, which polarity of charge is, by what it does. For instance, let's say that in one hand I have a positive charge and in the other hand I have a positive charge. These two charges will push each other apart. They'll repel. Because positive charges repel positive charges. Likewise, if I have a negative charge in this hand and a negative charge in this hand, they will push each other away. Negative repels negative. However, if I have a positive charge in one hand and a negative charge in the other hand, they'll try to attract each other. They'll pull themselves together. Charges with the same polarity will repel each other, and charges with opposite polarity will attract each other. This is a plastic bag that I've cut up into strips. It's very lightweight plastic. And the thing is, when something rubs against this plastic, it becomes negatively charged and whatever is rubbing against the plastic becomes positively charged. The reason for that is each one of these things, myself and the plastic bag, are full of charges, 
but the plastic bag collects negative charges and my body collects positive charges, so it's like we exchange charges and the plastic bag gets negative and I become positive. Let's charge it up. I think that's getting nicely charged. Yes! Now as you can see, the plastic bag is repelling itself. It's all the strands are spread apart because they're all negatively charged and this negatively charged bit here uh, repels this negatively charged bit here and so on and so forth all the way around. Now, of course, my body is positively charged. So when I put my body close to the plastic bag, as you saw, my body attracts the plastic. Especially this hand, because this hand is more strongly charged. Oh, it's trying to get me. Anyway, this repelling effect we call the field. Anything that is charged emits a field, and the charge uh, strength and the field strength is measured in volts. Don't ask me how many volts this is, you wouldn't believe me. But the charges and the fields they emit are what is providing the force that spreads this plastic bag out and repels all the little strands. The same thing works with positive charges. Let me show you. These are strips of nylon. Now when you rub something against nylon, it usually becomes positively charged, and whatever you're rubbing against the nylon becomes negatively charged as the two exchange charges. So, got myself a plastic bag here. Let's rub it against this nylon and get it all charged. Okay, the nylon is now positively charged, and this nylon repels itself because each strand of nylon is charged and positive repels positive. It's just like negative repels negative with the plastic bag that I showed you. <clears throat> now, if I get this plastic bag that I rubbed against it, when I move it close to the nylon, it attracts the nylon because positive charge and negative charge attract while positive repels positive. Now remember I said that everything around us is full of charge including our bodies. So you're probably thinking, well why don't our bodies just fly apart? Well the reason is the charges in everything are balanced for the most part. When I'm standing here, the same amount of negative charges as positive charges are in my body. So I don't just fly apart. I don't just walk around randomly attracting things or repelling things, unless my body is charged. Now, we call this kind of charge static charge. Now the reason we call it that is because static is a word for doesn't move. In other words, I can give something charges or I can take charges away, but they don't move around inside this nylon or that plastic bag. These things are called insulators. They don't allow the charges to move within them. But there are things that do let the charges move. These are metals for the most part. Let me show you. Here I have my plastic bag again. I'm going to charge it up by rubbing it with this piece of black nylon cloth. So let's charge it up. The plastic bag is now charged negatively and the nylon cloth is charged positively. Now I'm going to wrap this nylon cloth around a piece of copper wire. Copper is a conductor, it's a metal, and that means charges can move inside that copper wire. When I touch the nylon cloth to the copper wire, the charges move through the copper wire, so the entire wire is also charged just like the nylon. And we can tell that 
because when we move the copper wire close to the plastic bag now, the plastic bag is attracted to the wire because the wire is charged positively by touching the nylon. The same thing can be seen with positive charges. Here are my strips of nylon again. And now I'm going to rub them with a plastic bag so the nylon strips become positively charged and the plastic bag will become negatively charged. Now that both of these are charged, I'm going to wrap the plastic bag around the copper wire. So now the copper wire becomes negatively charged. And when I move the copper wire close to the nylon, you'll see that the negatively charged copper now attracts the nylon, just as the copper attracted the plastic bags when it was positively charged. So now when, it, when the wire is negatively charged, it's going to emit a field and the field from the negative charge attracts the positive charge and that's what brings them together. Now, of course, we don't always have to resort to rubbing things together to create electrical energy. This is a battery. This battery is full of chemicals and each end has a dissimilar metal. When the chemicals react, they break down and the positive charges all go to this end of the battery and the negative charges all go to this end of the battery. So this battery is full of charge just like everything else around us but in a battery it's separated so that one end is charged positively and the other end is charged negatively. Now this battery is only charged to one and a half volts so it's not enough to repel or attract anything but there is electrical energy in here. And just like the wire that I showed you a minute ago charges will travel from the positive side of the battery through metal wire or any other kind of metal to the negative end of the battery and negative charges will try and travel through the wire to the positive end of the battery and this allows us to do useful things with a battery like this I've hooked up this battery to some wires and to a light bulb now what happens is all the charges go running through this wire when these ho batteries are hooked up and all the charge energy moving through the wire causes friction. What was that Timmy? Oh, Timmy says his father told him that electrons flow through the wires. Hmm. Did your father say which direction they flow? Well Timmy, your father is correct. He's a very smart man. Electrons do flow through the wire, but this is the important bit. Electrons are not the most important part. We scientists call electrons charge carriers because all electrons do is cause the charges to move from one place to another. Electrons are what make the charges move, but the electrons aren't important. We're talking about the charges because the charges are electrical energy and the fields associated with those charges are what makes things happen. So let's not worry about the electrons for now, let's just concentrate on the charges. When I hook the wire up through this light bulb, the light bulb doesn't just get hot, it also gets bright. And this brightness is what can light up things using electrical energy. So, charges flowing through the wires from positive to negative and negative to positive make this light glow. And that's electrical energy in action. So, electricity. Electricity is the study of charges and fields. Any questions? I'm sure you have many questions. Questions like, what the heck did I just watch? And, okay, cool, you made the little bits of plastic bag jump around. What does that have to do with advanced electronics? 
Well, it has everything to do with advanced electronics. Charges and fields represent the electrical energy, and electrical engineering is all about the practical use and management of electrical energy. I mean, how can you talk about a capacitor if you don't understand what charges are? How can you talk about a field effect transistor if you don't know what a field is? Well, you can't. And that's what makes teaching these subjects very difficult sometimes. So let's take a look at some of the advanced science behind that little demonstration I gave you. Let's put on the thromboscope and dial it down to subatomic size. Okay, we found ourselves a typical atom here. This happens to be an atom of silicon. Now, this is atom has a nucleus which has protons and neutrons. The protons are red, the neutrons are blue. Orbiting around it are electrons. Now, I don't want to get into the whole quantum mechanics thing today, so we're going to use the model of atoms taught to chemistry students where we've got a nucleus of protons and neutrons and electrons orbiting around it. Now, all the protons are clustered in the nucleus. And you might think that because all the protons are positively charged, they would repel each other and blow themselves apart. But at the heart of an atom, there's a force called the strong atomic force, and it holds the protons together. Now, if there's enough protons, like in a great big atom, like let's say uranium, there is enough protons there to actually start repelling each other away, and that's called radioactive decay. Let's not go there today. The important thing here is, this is silicon. It has 14 protons. If it had more or less, it would not be silicon. Orbiting around it are electrons, and there are 14 electrons also. The number of electrons balances the number of protons. Because there's an equal number of protons and electrons, this whole silicon atom is not charged because the charges balance. Protons are positive, electrons are negative, and they both balance out. Now, if we want to, we can add electrons or take electrons away. That's called ionizing it. And if we do that, this silicon atom would be charged. If I took away an electron, it would be positively charged. If I added an electron, it would be negatively charged. But the thing is, silicon tries to balance itself out with a number of protons. So it takes a lot of energy to actually add an electron or subtract an electron. The electrons in this silicon are fairly close to the nucleus because there are so few protons. There's only 14 here. Now because it takes so much energy to add or subtract an electron from a silicon atom or from other small atoms like this, we call this an insulator. Now for a larger atom like copper, it has 26 protons and 26 electrons and they all orbit around in their various orbits called shells. The outermost shell is called the valence shell, and the thing about it is, for copper, the electrons orbit farther out. And because they orbit farther away from the protons, they are more easily able to be taken away from the copper atom or add electrons to the copper atom. That makes copper a conductor. So, elements that are good conductors tend to be metals, and the more protons and electrons you have in a metal atom, the better a conductor it's going to be. We know about copper, which has 29 protons and electrons, but really, gold is the king here, with 79 protons and electrons, followed closely by platinum with 78, silver and with 47. Below silver and copper are nickel with 28, iron with 26, chromium with 24, and way down we have aluminum with 13. Incidentally, nickel and chromium both are, will conduct, but not very well. There's some resistance there, and if they mix nickel and chromium together to make an alloy, that alloy is called nichrome, and they make stoves and hair dryers out of it, because you can run electricity through it, but it will heat up 
because there's more friction, more resistance involved than there is in a good conductor like copper or platinum or gold. Anyway, good conductor, bad conductor, it's all about how easy it is to add an electron to an atom or subtract an electron from an atom. It's all about the ionization. If something's easy to ionize, then it's a good conductor. In order for us to talk about electricity, we have to start at the power source. Now, there are a lot of sources of electrical power. I've mentioned static electricity, and there's also uh, electromagnetic energy, which is gotten by a dynamo or a generator or something like that. But the easiest way to get electrical energy is from a battery. Now, a battery gets its energy chemically. And the battery inside consists of a large chunk of molecules that uh, are held together with ionic bonding. Now, I'm not really a chemical person here, so I don't know what kind of chemicals they are, but it's basically this chunk of molecules inside a container that also holds a solvent. And on either end of this container, there are two different metals, two dissimilar metals. And what happens is the solvent breaks down this chunk of molecules in the middle. And the molecules themselves, because they're held together with ionic bonding, when the molecules break apart into individual atoms, some of the atoms are charged positively and some of them are charged negatively. And at some point, they will be attracted to the dissimilar metals. The positive ions will go towards the metal at the positive end of the battery. The negative ions will go to the negative end of the battery. And that will cause the entire battery to become positively charged and negatively charged on either end. On the positive end, we have positive ions, which are lacking electrons. On the negative end are a whole bunch of atoms which have a surplus of electrons, and that's why they are charged. So we end up with this power source, this battery, that's essentially one big charged particle, and the charges on either end emit fields. Now, to see how this battery affects a wire, let's aim our thromboscope over here at this wire made out of copper atoms. Now I've programmed the thromboscope to simplify its diagram so all we see are the valence electrons in each copper atom. And this example wire is exactly one atom wide so we can get a better idea of what's going on at the atomic level. So you see there's this row of atoms and each one has some valence electrons orbiting the nucleus. Now let's introduce a negative end of the battery to this wire. Let's see what happens. Now, as I just explained, the negative end of a battery is a bit of metal that has a whole bunch of negatively charged ions that are clinging to it, so the negative end of the battery has a surplus of electrons. All these electrons emit their little electric fields, and they're all repelling each other. They're trying to get rid of those electrons. They'd like to go to the positive end of the battery, but there's a big chunk of chemical between that's preventing that. So, let's say that we touch the battery to this little wire. The negative end of the battery emits this field that's pushing electrons away, and the wire sitting there is neutrally charged. So the negative field of the battery pushes the electrons onto the first atom of this copper wire. The copper atom next to the battery now has more electrons than protons, so it's now ionized. It's negatively charged. Because it's negatively charged, it emits its own little field, just like the field from the battery. So that field energy has been transferred from the battery to that first atom. We can say that a charge has moved from the battery to this atom. This negatively charged atom is now like a tiny little battery itself. Its negative field is caused by a surplus of electrons, and it's trying to repel these electrons. It can't repel them to the right, toward the battery, because the battery is still negatively charged, and its field is repelling electrons too. Now take a look at the second atom along in the wire. It's neutrally charged, just like the first atom was before the battery came along. It's sitting next to this charged ion, which is trying to repel electrons. Now this atom is a conductor, so it's easy to ionize, so guess what? The electrons on the first atom get repelled and transfer left to the second atom. Now that second atom is an ion, the charge has moved onto it and carried its field energy along with it. 
the first atom has now gotten rid of the extra electrons, so it's neutrally charged again. While this has been going on, the battery's chemicals have been at work, creating more ions inside itself, so the electrons at the negative end of the battery have been replenished. The battery will keep doing this until its chemicals run out and the battery goes dead. Now we have the battery with its electrons and its field recharged, and the second atom is charged with its own field. The battery and the atom are negatively charged and trying to repel the electrons, so the prior process repeats itself. The battery charges up the first atom, and the second atom charges up the neutral atom to its left. This process keeps repeating. As the battery generates more charges, they propagate to the neutrally charged conductor atoms, which themselves become little batteries, and propagate charges down the wire away from the negative battery terminal. Now let's take a look at the positive end of the battery. The chemical reactions inside cause this end to have fewer electrons than it should have. It's positively charged, and it emits a field. This field attracts electrons. Positive attracts negative. When the battery touches a wire, because the wire is a conductor and easy to ionize, the electrons in the nearest atom are attracted to the battery. This makes the battery slightly less positively charged, and the leftmost atom is now positively charged. A positive charge has moved from the battery to that atom, and it has carried its field along with it. This atom is now like a little battery, emitting its own little field and trying to attract electrons. Just as you'd expect, the electrons are attracted from the next atom along, so the charge is passed along the conductor away from the battery. And meanwhile, the battery's chemicals react and produce more positive charges there. This process continues, producing positive charges and propagating them down the wire toward negative as electrons get attracted from the negative toward the positive. So, we've got negative charges propagating along, away from the negative toward positive, and we've got positive charges propagating away from positive toward negative. Let's take a look now at the middle of the wire. It's just sitting there, and positive charges are moving along from one end, and negative charges are coming at it from the other end, so sooner or later, they'll meet up. Oh no! Now what's going to happen? Well, to answer that, let's take a look at the negative end of the battery again. Let's have the thromboscope advance time a bit. Now I've stopped time here to show you something. This atom here is negatively charged. It has a surplus of electrons. It is an ion. This atom next to it is neutrally charged. The number of electrons matches the number of protons. Because this atom is neutrally charged, it means it's more positive than this atom. We can therefore consider this neutrally charged atom as a weak positive charge. Now let's advance time a bit. Okay, the electrons have transferred to the next atom along, and the negative charge has moved toward positive. But what about this atom? It's now neutrally charged, or as we said, weakly positive. So what's happened here is, as the electrons transferred toward positive, a negative charge went toward positive, and a positive charge went toward negative. Now let's take a look at the positive terminal again. I've stopped time again here. This atom is positively charged. It's an ion, it has too few electrons, it's emitting a positive field, which attracts electrons. This atom is neutrally charged, so we can also say that this atom is more negative than this atom. So we can say that this is a weak negative charge. Let's advance time a few shakes. The electrons in the neutrally charged atom were attracted onto the positive atom, so the positive charge has moved toward negative. This atom is now neutral, or weakly negative. So as you can see, as the positive charge moved toward negative, a negative charge also moved toward positive. 
Now let's take another look at the middle of the wire. As you can see, this atom is negatively charged with too many electrons that it's trying to get rid of, and this atom is positively charged with too few electrons. So what do you think is going to happen? That's right, the electrons jump onto the positively charged atom, making it negative, and this atom positive. It's just like at either end of the wire like I showed you before. As a positive charge goes toward negative, a negative charge goes toward positive at the same time. Here, however, the process happens a little bit more energetically, since both atoms concerned are charged ions, rather than one being charged and one being neutral. So let's let time roll on. So, now you should have a better idea of what's happening when electrons move at the atomic level. As electrons move from negative to positive, they carry negative charges toward positive, and positive charges move toward negative in opposite directions at the same time. To get off on a sidetrack here, everybody always asks, why do we make electrons negative? Why can't they be positive? I mean, when the world adopted the metric system, every textbook and lesson plan and scientific paper had to be rewritten to use the new form of measurement. And they did it. So it would be easy just to rename electrons as being positive, right? Well, let's pretend that we're in an alternate universe and Benjamin Franklin flipped the coin the opposite way and electrons are positive. Okay? So we've got our battery and it's positive on one side, negative on the other. The electrons come from positive toward negative. As the electrons move, they carry positive charges with them. And as the positive charges move toward negative, they leave negative charges moving toward positive. So, charge flow. Positive charges go toward negative and negative charges go toward positive in opposite directions at the same time. Well, wait a minute. In our real world, as electrons move, positive charges go toward negative and negative charges go toward positive at the same time. So what's the difference? Now, granted, if we renamed them like that, the plastic bags would be positive, the nylon would be negative, and our NPN transistor would actually be their PNP transistor. But other than that, everything would be the same. So whenever somebody thinks about, you know, renaming electrons to be positive, well, the physicists and engineers just say, who cares about the electrons? The electrons aren't the most important part. It's the charges. So, that's why we've never bothered making electrons positive. Now, uh, I th we should take some time out here to kind of define terms. When we physicists and engineers talk about charges, we say things like, the charges move, the charges do this, and the charges do that. Well, the th and we also say things like, we now have a field here, and this field does this, and the field gets carried and whatnot. But the thing is, a charge is not a thing. A charge is a property of a material. A material much, a property much like uh, smell or taste or heat. Like for instance, if I have this piece of metal and I heat one end of it, Sooner or later, my hand is going to get hot, and we say the heat has traveled. But really, nothing's traveled. It's just that the heat property is propagated along this wire, and finally it gets to the other side. Now, there's nothing really physically moving, like heat didn't pack up its bags and walk over. And likewise, charges are not a thing. 
they don't really move. Now the electrons inside there move, but charges are energy. Electrons are things. I can't have a cup full of charge. I can't, just like I can't have a cup full of heat. I can have a cup full of hot metal, or I can have a cup full of electrons, if I have the right equipment, and I don't mind that it might blow my hand off, but I can do it. But charges are a property of something. They're not really something that exists. Unfortunately, the way our mind and our language is put together, people always talk about the charges as things that move from one place to another. And that's not exactly the case. Likewise with fields. When something is charged, it emits a field. But a field is not a thing. I can't grab a hold of it and say, okay, I've got some field here. The field is simply a property of the material, and it's really just the effect that one material has on another. As these things move closer, the effect gets stronger. As the f they move further apart, the effect gets weaker. So, the field is just a property of how these things interact. It's not something that actually exists. But, you know, our, like I say, our brains are wired so that the language refers to them as an actual thing. So, like I say, Electrons are things, and charges are energy, and we measure charge in volts. And that's why a physicist will not define a volt as the amount of uh, energy required to move one amp of current through one ohm of resistance. They refer to it as one joule per coulomb of electrons. A joule is energy, and the electrons are defined in terms of coulombs. Now, um, another thing that may confuse you at this point is, remember, when we have current flow, positive charges move toward negative and negative charges move toward positive at the same time. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, well, does that mean that as positive charges flow through, say, a resistor, I get a positive voltage, and then as negative charges flow through the resistor, I get a negative voltage, and does that mean that the voltages cancel out, or do they add up, or what's going on? I mean, I've got two different kinds of things happening here. Well, what you have to understand is both positive charges flowing and negative charges flowing are caused by the same thing electrons moving from negative to positive. Let me show you with this. This is a model of our one atom wide conductor with the positive terminal of the battery on the left and the negative terminal of the battery on the right. And on this model the valence electrons are represented by these pennies. Yeah, I've got a huge budget. At the start of this process the chemical reactions inside the battery take electrons away from the positive end of the battery. This causes the battery to become positively charged, and it emits a positive field. Now this field attracts electrons. So the electron of the atom to the right of the battery gets attracted onto the battery. So it moves onto the battery, and it leaves behind an ionized conductor atom. So now this conductor atom to the battery's right is sort of an electron gap. Now this means that that atom is now positively charged like the battery was. And it emits a positive field which attracts electrons. So it attracts an electron from the atom to its right. And that electron gets transferred over and that leaves another rightward gap. And this series of events keeps on working all the way along that conductor. When this positively charged electron gap reaches the negative terminal of the battery, the chemical reactions inside the battery produce more electrons as they're taking electrons away from positive terminal of the battery. So you can think of a battery 
as a charge pump. It takes electrons away from the positive end of the battery and sends them out the negative end of the battery. And this cycle repeats itself. As electrons are taken away from the positive terminal of the battery, it attracts electrons from the conductor, and the cycle keeps repeating on and on. This is a short circuit. So anyway, as electrons move, the negative charges move toward positive, and positive charges move toward negative, like I was saying. But the thing is, you can't have a flow of negative charges toward positive without a flow of positive charges flowing toward negative. They're both caused by the same thing, electron movement, and they both take place at the same time. And the other way to look at it is, a flow of negative charges toward positive is the same thing as a flow of positive charges toward negative. They both happen at the same time. You can't have one without the other. As electrons move, the charges go in opposite directions. And that's the way it is. So, anytime you have electrons flowing, you have both things happening, but really, any kind of flow is at the same time is opposite. A flow of negative charges toward positive is the same thing as a flow of positive charges toward negative. And this is why when you're analyzing a circuit, you have to pick one. Either express it using positive charges toward negative or negative charges toward positive. Now we call positive toward negative conventional current and we call negative toward positive electron flow current. Either one is valid because you can't have one without the other. Incidentally, um, a lot of people have left negative comments in my videos saying, shame on you for using conventional current. You should use electron flow because that's what's really happening. Well, the joke's on you, bub. Both things happen at the same time. And that's why it's perfectly valid to choose either uh, conventional current or electron flow, but not both at the same time. And because I grew up thinking in terms of conventional current, and because most people use conventional current as they describe transistors and things like that, that's what I use. Both types are perfectly valid. So don't get on my back about using conventional current anymore, all right? Another thing that we need to define is, if we look back at that animation with the pennies, you can see that uh, as electrons move, the electrons go one way and they leave a gap on the other side, which is a positive charge. A lot of engineers and physicists will therefore say that an electron is a negative charge and they call a positive charge a hole because it's that gap that the electron left behind. So they say ele uh, charge flow is electrons going one way and holes going the other. And this is really bad. We can't do this anymore. There are several reasons why this is bad. One reason is because of semiconductor technology. In a P-type semiconductor, it's got a crystal matrix of silicon which has impurities embedded in it, like boron, and the boron atoms have gaps in their valence shell that we also call holes. And because there are these electron gaps in the, in the uh, silicon crystal matrix, electrons can go from atom to atom and ionize them, so the whole thing becomes easy to ionize, which is why P-type material will conduct electricity. The electrons go jumping through all these little valence gaps, but the other problem is people call these valence gaps holes. So we've got a P-type semiconductor that's full of holes. They refer to gaps in this crystal structure. When we have charge conductivity going along, we have electrons going here and holes going the other. So the holes are actually positive charges. Now, when we try to describe how current flows through a semiconductor, all of a sudden we say, well, we've got holes here, and the electrons go here, and the holes go there, and these holes and that holes, 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 holes. 
and it's confusing. Now, I say that we should still call the gaps in the p-type semiconductor holes, but let's call positive charges positive charges. Then we won't get the whole electron hole, semiconductor hole confusion going on. And that's all I want to say about semiconductors today. Now, there's one more thing that I have to tell you. And I really don't want to, because it's kind of a brain bender. But if you're going out for a physics degree or an engineering degree, which is physics, this is probably going to come up in conversation. So you know what? I am just going to tell you this. And I'm going to count on you to absorb it and think about it and remember it. Hopefully things will be clearer after I do. The thing is, the animations I showed you earlier from the thromboscope show electrons going from atom to atom. Like you're walking across stepping stones across a brook, one after the other after the other. And that's not exactly how electrons really travel. In a good conductor, all the valence electrons in that material are actually very dense. There's a lot of them. It's pretty much like a solid mass of free electrons moving around inside this conductor. So you can think of a conductor like this tube and the solid mass of free electrons as this dowel. Okay. Now I want you to further imagine that this tube is miles long, okay? And the dowel inside it is also miles long. And somewhere at the other end of this tube is a person sitting there holding on to the dowel, all right? Now, let's say I grab my end of the dowel and I push it a little bit. At the other end, this person feels the rod move and their hand moves pretty much at the same time. I push here, the other end moves at the same time. So what's actually happened here? On my end of the dowel, I have imparted kinetic energy into the dowel. I've applied a force and the dowel moves and work is done. At the far end, this person is holding the dowel. The dowel moves, their hand moves. Kinetic energy is transferred to this other person's hand, the hand moves, and work is done. Alright? So let me go through that again. I impart kinetic energy. Miles away, this kinetic energy is imparted to the person's hand. And it's imparted instantly, just under the speed of light, actually. But the thing is, the actual carrier of that energy, the dowel, well, that only moved a little bit. And it didn't move anywhere near the speed of light. It was actually very slow. I mean, I could walk faster than that. So, once again, because the dowel is solid, it will transmit kinetic energy for long distances instantly, but the actual dowel, the carrier of that energy, only moves a little bit, and it doesn't move very far. And this is the way it is with electricity. When I have a conductor, I apply a field, a voltage field at one end. All the conducting uh, electrons move instantly. And the other end of the conductor is charged up. And the voltage gets to the other end pretty much instantaneously, just under the speed of light. So the charges are transmitted immediately. But the actual electrons in the conductor only moved a little bit. They didn't move miles, just a little. And they didn't move at the speed of light, they moved very slowly. And when I say slowly, I mean maybe a fraction of a centimeter an hour. I know, right? You've been taught your whole life that electrons go zipping along through the conductor at the speed of light and they just don't. The charges move instantly, the energy moves instantly, but the electrons, the charge carriers, they're hardly moving at all. They don't have to. And that's the main thing about charges and fields. 
And that's another reason why it's a bad idea to call negative charges electrons and positive charges holes. Because the charges move much, much more differently than the electrons. The charge energy moves instantly miles away at the speed of light. The electrons themselves, they're hardly moving at all. Electrons and charges are different things. Electrons are things, charges are energy. So, once again, forget about electrons and holes. Call them negative charges and positive charges. So that way, we remove the idea of the energy from the electron and we can treat them as separate things. Remember, the electrons are not the most important part. It's the charges, because the charges are the energy, and the energy is what we're really after here. Now, let's pretend that the person way down the line, miles away, has connected the dowel up to a pump that's connected to a, a ball of some kind. Sort of like this. And the person rings me up on the cell phone and says, hey, I need you to pump up my ball for me. So I say, okay. I go over and I grab my end of the dowel and I start to pump it back and forth, back and forth. What am I doing here? I'm applying kinetic energy to this dowel. Miles away, the dowel is attached to the pump and it pumps air. Now, when I apl I'm applying all the energy, and it gets transmitted miles away instantly in both directions, one way after the other. And this is the way that alternating current works. I apply positive voltage, then negative voltage, then positive voltage, then negative voltage. Miles away, whatever I've got attached to this wire, like a light bulb, say, uh, energy flows po into it positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, and it uses the energy to create light or heat or whatever it is that I want to do with it. So, once again, I apply voltage to this end in one direction, then the other, then one polarity, then the other, then one polarity, then the other. That voltage is transmitted down the line instantly. But the electrons themselves, the charge carriers, they're hardly moving at all. And really what they're doing is they're vibrating in place. They're transmitting energy from miles away, but the electrons themselves are just kind of going back and forth. And because the electrons go one way and then the other and end up at the same point, we can say that on average, statistically, the electrons haven't moved. I mean, if it ends up in the same place it starts, it hasn't moved, right? Well, actually, it's vibrated, and it's transmitted energy a long distance away, but the actual electrons, statistically, aren't going anywhere. I know it sounds crazy when you think about it that way, but that's the way electricity works. Right now, I'm sitting in a house that's over 100 years old. The electric wiring was installed back when Edison and Westinghouse were still alive. For generations, hundreds of miles away, electricity has been generated at some kind of power plant, and it's been transmitted through wires to my house, through its wires, and over the, over the last century it's heated up the stove and lit the lights and charged up the computers and run the TVs and sweepers and whatever it is. All that time, it's transmitted megawatts of energy into this house to be used. Inside those wires, those hundred-year-old wires, the electrons sitting in there are the same electrons that were installed there over a hundred years ago. That's electricity. <laughs> According to Professor Beatty, this is a better physical model for electricity. This rope and pulley system allows for the return path of electrons as they go through the conductor to the resistive load and back to the other terminal of the battery or generator or what have you. 
Now, I've put a piece of cardboard over the left end of the system so that it acts as a resistive load, and it will use energy converting it to heat via friction. Now, once again, you have to imagine that this rope is miles long. There's miles between the left pulley and right pulley, and my body is going to stand in for the battery. So I grab the rope and I impart energy into the system. Miles away, instantly, the energy is used at the resistive load and generates heat. But the actual rope itself, well, that only moved a little bit, and it didn't move very fast. Alternating current is the same way. I grab the rope and I move it one way, then the other, then one way, then the other. Miles away, the rope generates friction against the cardboard instantly, but the actual rope itself, not only is it hardly moving and it's moving slowly, it's actually not moving at all technically because it ends up at the same place it starts. Now you might ask, are there any kind of conductors where the charge carriers are not dense? Well, yes there are. We call these substances semiconductors. And because the charge carriers inside a semiconductor are not dense, you can do some pretty magical things with them. But I don't want to talk about semiconductors today. Okay, that's it. I get questions every once in a while about people wanting to know how basic components function. Well, now that we've got a better handle on how conductivity works with charges and fields and all that, let's take a look at basic components and see what's really ticking inside of them. First come resistors. Now, resistors are extremely simple. All a resistor does is it limits the amount of charge flow that can go through it. Now, the amount of charge flow depends on how much resistance there is and how much voltage there is behind it. The more voltage you get, the more current you get. The less voltage, the less current. If you have a fixed voltage, the more resistance you have, the less current there's going to be. If you lower the resistance, greater amount of current will flow. That's Ohm's law. So, if I have a fixed value resistor, I'm going to apply voltage to it and current flows. So current is the result of this voltage and this resistance. That's also what a transistor does. It limits the flow of charges that can go through it. It limits the current. However, its limit is not fixed. It can actually vary its resistance based on an input signal. But that's all a transistor is doing is just restricting the flow of electrons and the flow of charges. You know, I told you before, I didn't want to talk about semiconductors today, so I'm not going to, and this time I mean it. Now, another interesting component we should talk about is capacitors. I have here a model of a capacitor, and a capacitor is essentially two plates of conductor, of metal. And they're usually separated by some sort of insulator. In this instance, it's an air gap. But usually, in a purpose-built conductor, it's some sort of insulator or dielectric. Now, let's say that I've applied a positive voltage to this plate. And I've connected this plate to some other circuit, or perhaps a negative terminal of the battery. When I have a positive voltage on this wire, it attracts electrons, because that's what positive voltage does and the electrons migrate toward the positive, and as they do, it leaves behind positive charges. So, this plate becomes positively charged. Now, this plate, when this plate is positively charged, it emits a field, because it's charged. That's what it does. And this field goes through the, this plate here. And because there's a field on this conductive plate, charges move. That's why charges move, because of fields. So the field causes charges to move. Because this is a positive field, it attracts electrons. So electrons are attracted from whatever this is onto this plate. Now this plate has a surplus of electrons, so the plate is negatively charged. So when all this is done, 
this plate is positively charged at the same voltage that was applied to it, and this plate is charged negatively. So this acts like a little battery. It is a charged event. If we short this out, then of course charges will flow across it, and it, these plates won't be charged anymore. But if we keep them separated and isolated and insulated, then they will become charged. Now when these are charged up, they are storing electrical energy. If we take these and short them out, or apply them to say, I don't know, a light bulb or something like that, it'll cause the light bulb to glow momentarily until the capacitor is discharged and, you know, we don't have any difference in charging longer. So when we charge this thing up, it's storing energy. Now, that's direct current. If we apply just one fixed voltage to this thing, this will charge up and the voltage on the plates will be the same. So if we were to hook up a meter, a, a, a current meter to this event, what we would see is a quick surge of electricity as the uh, plates become charged. Once they're charged, well now the electrons can't move anymore because there's an insulator. So we'll see that quick surge of electron current and then nothing. However, what happens if we apply alternating current to this? This plate would become positively charged, then this plate becomes negatively charged and current flows into it. As this voltage goes negative, this plate becomes negatively charged and it repels the electrons from this plate. The electrons go flowing out of that wire, the charges, negative charges go flowing with them, and this plate becomes positively charged. So, these are always in opposite polarities, these plates. As I apply alternating current, the field causes the charges in this plate to move based on the field and charge movements of this plate. So, if this plate is uh, applied alternating current, then this plate always has alternating current flowing through it as well. So this capacitor will essentially allow alternating current to pass through it. Direct current, you'll see a sudden inflow of current and then nothing, but alternating current will flow straight through it. And that's how a capacitor works. Charges and fields. Um, one other thing about a capacitor like this, the capacitor will not charge if only one side is attached to something. If the other lead of the capacitor is left floating, what happens is I apply this to a positive charge or some other charge, this plate becomes charged. But this plate, because it's a good conductor and the charge carriers are dense, well these charges are all packed in there. There's no place for them to go. So this plate does not become charged. Also, because, let's say this is positively charged, this plate is neutrally charged, it is kind of like it's weakly positively charged. So when this emits its field, this plate is resisting that field. And so this plate will not become strongly charged. So if you only have one lead of a capacitor attached, you can't charge it. It only works if you've got both sides connected to something. That's something a lot of people don't understand about, train, about uh, capacitors, but that's why that is. In case you don't believe me, I'll demonstrate it. I have my voltmeter set up here, and I've got a 1,000 microfarad capacitor and a 9-volt battery. Now I will charge up the capacitor by touching the negative lead of the capacitor to the negative pole of the battery and the positive lead of the capacitor to the positive pole of the battery. Now the capacitor should be fully charged, so let's measure it. Now as you can see, the capacitor is pretty much completely charged up. Now I'm going to discharge the capacitor 
And then I'm going to charge up the capacitor again, but this time I'll just place the positive lead of the capacitor to the positive pole of the battery, and I'll leave the negative lead of the capacitor floating. Now, let's measure that and see what kind of voltage we have. This time the capacitor is only charged to a few tenths of a volt. Pretty much nothing. The density of the electrons in the negative pole of the capacitor has not only caused it to not charge up, but it's also resisted the positive pole of the capacitor to charge. So nothing happens in a capacitor if you don't have both leads attached. So anyway, electricity is the study of charges. Charges and the fields that they emit. I know I've covered a great deal of information today. There's a lot to go on, but I want to leave you with one last thing. Let's say that I have a long, thin wire, okay? And I have it connected to alternating current. Now, this wire is not near another plate or conductor or anything, so it's perfectly free to become charged. So, as I apply alternating current to this long, thin wire, it becomes charged and emits a field. All right? Now let's say that over here I have another long, thin wire and I connect it to something else. This wire is being charged with alternating current, so it's being charged and discharged and charged and discharged, and it's emitting this field, this pulsating field. Now, just like the gap in the capacitor, the, the field affects this long, thin wire. And the field causes charges to propagate through it, and the charge flow goes through this wire to whatever. <clears throat> so, energy is transmitted through charges and fields. Do you know what the old Greek word for long, thin wire is? Antenna! That's how these things work. Charges and fields. We charge up the antenna. The field causes charge flow to happen in here. And that's radio. That's broadcast TV. That's satellite communications. That's GPS. That's microwaves. That's radar. That's cellular. That's Wi-Fi. All of these different phenomena easily understood once we understand electricity is charges and fields. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that write in and say, oh no, that's not an electric field, that's an electromagnetic field. Well, big deal. Yes, it's true that because this is an alternating current and it goes from positive to negative, that it's constantly changing. And a changing electric field is the same as a stable magnetic field. And a changing magnetic field is the same as a stable electric field. That's Faraday's law. And because this field is constantly changing, positive to negative to positive to negative, the nature of the, sh of the field changes. It goes from electric field to magnetic field, to electric field to magnetic, electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic. And if we're looking at this field, we see it'll say, it'll look like electrical, magnetic, electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic. One type of field begetting the next on and on into infinity. This is how the electromagnetic wave propagates itself through space. That's Maxwell's equations. But so what? Look, we're getting away from the basic here, which is... We apply electricity to this thing, emits field, field causes charge propagation, information is shared. And people say electronics is hard to understand. That was easy! If you understand the basic principles of electricity. So why don't they teach the basic principles of electricity? Ay, oh, that's twice. You know, I probably haven't helped you very much today. I've tried to tell you how electricity really works in the atomic form. 
But the only problem is, now you're going to go back to your basic electronics course, or your hobby, or your job as a technician or electrician or whatever it is that you do, and all you're going to hear about and read about are electrons, electrons, electrons. Electrons go here, electrons do this, blah, blah, blah. And you're not going to get back into charges until you start going out for an advanced physics course or engineering. So, you know, there's probably going to be some confusion still, and I'm sorry about that. But until we change the way that we teach basic electricity, electronics is going to be harder to teach. So when you're in class and your teacher's talking about electrons and maybe electrons and holes and all this kind of thing, just smile and nod. Smile and nod. Yep, you're right. And just keep in the back of your mind about the charges and fields. And if there are any teachers or instructors watching this video, please let's work to change the way that we teach basic electricity. Don't do it because it's going to make students' lives easier. Don't do it because it's going to make it easier to teach basic things. Don't do it because it's going to make teaching advanced subjects easier. Do it for the sake of my house. Because if I keep getting emails saying, there's no such thing as a positive charge, or how do capacitors work, or why don't they rename electrons as positive? I'm just going to keep banging my head against this wall, and sooner or later, my house is going to fall down. So for the sake of my house, please, let's work to change the way we teach basic electricity. Thanks for watching.